Let me take a moment and talk about Riverside.fm. It allows you to record studio quality audio and up to 4K video. When you need to record audio and video, Riverside.fm can do it. So if you're looking for a hero platform for all your recording needs, from podcasts to webinars to any video content, Riverside.fm. I've got a promo code for you where you'll receive a 30% discount on the first three months of your subscription. I'll give it to you twice. The promo code is ship it. All one word, ship it, and you'll pick up a 30% discount on your first three months of your subscription. Riverside.fm. Pop Warner is a name that is closely associated with youth football. The name is in honor of the man that not only founded the organization, but whoever made his mark on the game we love. Let's take a look at the accomplishments of the legendary Glenn Pop Warner in this special episode coming up. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pigpen, your portal to positive football history. And we have a little bit of a format change. Uh, We're going to give you daily football history, but we're not going to do the daily history headlines that we've been doing traditionally for the last couple of years. Those are still available. Uh, You can go to uh, PigskinDispatch.com each and every day. An article will post up just like it always does. And attached to that is the Daily Football History Headlines podcast from past years. You can still listen to that. Uh, You can, uh, you know, it's still relevant information because it is football history. Or you can join our newsletter, uh, subscribe every day. You will get everything from the Pigskin Dispatch and the Sports Jersey Dispatch podcast as well as Orville Mulligan and Sports History Network news uh, coming to you inbox every day just before 7 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. So you, a couple different ways you can choose that. Uh, you can join our subscription by clicking the links in the show notes of this podcast or going to jerseydispatch.com or pigskindispatch.com and following the instructions there to become an email subscriber every day just before 7 a.m. Get the information you need. So let's talk about our subject today. In this new format, we're going to be telling you a little bit about people, teams, players, and some great stories from each of great football history. And today we're going to talk about one of the people that I think are probably one of the faces, if I was going to create a Mount Rushmore of football history, this gentleman would certainly have to be on it. And that is legendary coach Pop Warner. Now, on April 5th, 1871, in the town of Springville, New York, a child was born at the Warner residence whose parents named him Glenn Scobie Warner. This youngster would grow up to be one of the most influential innovators of American football in the game's history. Now, how did he become Pop? Interesting story here. Young Glenn grew up in near the New York town where he was born and took an interest to sports. It took some time, though. According to a great book by author Lars Anderson titled Carlisle vs. Army, Jim Thorpe, Dwight Eisenhower, Pop Warner, and the Forgotten Story of Football's Greatest Battle, Warner was a plump youngster who often was a target of local schoolyard bullies. A group of boys would constantly pick on the boy that they called Butter because of his soft disposition. One winter's day, this all changed, and Butter Warner's usually mild temperament curdled into something altogether different. Warner's father, William, was a Union Civil War hero, and he often put the boy on his knee to teach him how bravery and standing up in the face of adversity helped him survive the ravages of war. Fast forward to the trip home from school as the bully pulled off Butter's hat and stomped it into a half-frozen puddle. The enraged, overly victimized 10-year-old had reached his limit and barreled into a surprise tormentor, taking him to the ground and then pummeled the bully while on the ground. Warner reflected later in life that this is the moment that he realized that he could assert his will on others and influence an outcome. This moment also gave him some self-confidence. As he got to this age, he also experienced working hard on the family's 
farm with his brothers. And all this hard work transformed his pudgy body into a more athletic tone to match his newfound confidence. After a failed attempt to become a military man like his father, Glenn moved with his family from New York to Wichita Falls, Texas. And after a few years there, he decided to attend college back in the East. In June of 1894, he graduated from Cornell University. And while attending the school, he played football and was nominated as a team captain during his senior season. He was 22 years old during that final playing season and by far the oldest man on the squad. The other team members, as a quasi-tribute and friendly jest, referred to their elder statesman fondly as Pop. And it was a name that would stick and it was more well known to us than later than his God-given name of Glenn. And that's how he got the name of Pop Warner. Now, after graduation, Pop took a job in Buffalo, New York, practicing law. But after four months, he left the firm and decided to take a different career course, that of coaching football. The University of Georgia, with its whopping enrollment then of only 248 students, hired Warner to lead their football 11 in September of 1895. The program just recently started and needed some guidance, and boy did they ever make the right hire to do so. UGA went 3-4 and four in Warner's first season, but then rebounded in year two with a perfect 4-0 and record. Warner, though, left the school after that banner season because of the poor pay and even poorer facilities that he and his team had in Georgia. He returned north to his beloved Cornell in 1897 to coach their football team. Warner and his Cornell squads proved to be quite formidable as they registered a fantastic 15-5-1 record during his tenure at the helm. However, the two-year itch got to pop once again, and he took an opportunity to move on to the employment of the Carlisle Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. It was a move that was historic as he transformed the School of Native Americans into a national powerhouse. Now, Pop Warner immediately brought organization and discipline to his new team. The players responded diligently listening to their coaches' instructions and game plans, and as a result, the gifted athletes started producing win after win for their school. By 1903, the Carlisle Indians were the talk of the great iron world of the day with a stellar 11-2 record. From the seasons of 1904 through 1914, four of his teams recorded only one loss during their seasons. And one big reason was perhaps the greatest athlete of a generation and a guy named Jim Thorpe playing there. Thorpe, interestingly enough, in his first season, uh, was considered too small by Warner to even get onto the field. But Thorpe begged and pleaded, and the legendary coach uh, finally gave him some playing time. And boy, much to his surprise, it was probably the best decision he had ever made in his coaching career, as the athleticism of Thorpe far outmatched most of the opponents that Carlisle faced. Now, in 1915, Pop was on the move again as the University of Pittsburgh came calling and lured him to their fold with lucrative pay and much improved facilities. This paid off for both parties as four different Pittsburgh teams under Warner from 1915 to 1923 went undefeated. Riding his success in Pittsburgh, the folks at Stanford took notice out west and offered him a coaching job at their school that Pop could not turn down. His Cardinal teams won three Rose Bowls and went without a loss in 1926. And while at the helm, he had some touch not players there too at Stanford, including the legendary back Ernie Nevers. Alas, the desire to coach back in East uh, took hold and Warner returned to Pennsylvania to coach at Temple University from 1933 through the 1938 season. All right, so we told you about some of the great teams that uh, Warner coached, and we told you about some of the outstanding players behind his coaching success. But remember, at the beginning of this post, we said that he was a great innovator of the game. Now listen to this, what he's done, what this man accomplished. To his credit, Coach Glenn Warner is responsible for such items in football as the three-point stance, screen passes, a spiral punt, naked bootleg, double reverse, 
the single wing and the double wing formations. And he also takes some of the credit for the modern day numbering of players' jerseys uh, and the requirements of wearing shoulder pads by players, thigh pads, uh, lightweight uniforms, and safer helmets. And a use of blocking sleds and tackling dummies at practice sessions to prepare players with proper technique while not beating up on their teammates too much. Now that's a pretty big long laundry list of uh, contributions and it uh, sounds real familiar uh, you know some of these great uh, people you know, like I said I put him on that Mount Rushmore with uh, Amos Alonzo Stagg, Walter Camp, uh, Pop Warner and I think I'd put Coach Paul Brown on there as well these men really contributed quite a bit to the game but perhaps Pop Warner's biggest contribution to the game was the development of youth players and their preparation in the fundamentals of the game to be ready to take higher levels of the gridiron to new places with the creation of the Pop Warner Leagues for Kids in 1929. Warner himself said this was his biggest achievement in football. Pop Warner football, almost a century later, is still going strong, introducing youth to the game of football in a safe and organized environment. And this is a testament to its founder that still bears the name of him, him Pop Warner Football. You know, just a great uh, man to talk about. And we're going to, you know, get, use this as a segue to some other conversations we're going to have here over the next week uh, with some great stories. And I think you're going to really enjoy that. But this is a foundation building uh, episode here talking about Pop Warner. And you'll hear his name again mentioned i am quite sure in the next seven days if you listen each and every day to the pigskin dispatch podcast and read our blog posts every day and we thank you for listening to that uh, you can find us pigskindispatch.com if you want to give us some feedback it's pigskindispatch at gmail.com you can also find us on the sports history network where we are one of uh, more than a two dozen different podcasts on sports history all in one place sportshistorynetwork.com And don't forget, we also have some great posts and great podcasts on our other website, the Sports Jersey Dispatch at jerseydispatch.com, where we talk about the top competitors in sports history and where I get educated uh, by the numbers and the uniforms that they sported during their contests. So make sure you check that out, too. Till tomorrow, everybody, have a great gridiron day. That's all the football history we have today, folks. Join us back tomorrow for more of your football history. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? you should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, Check out the 1963 Vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order.